the award-winning team building healthier communities, changing face of a medical education, Jamie Oliver's small steps towards a food revolution, and why vaccines are more than just child's play. Hello and welcome to Championing the Public's Health, a programme by the Royal Society for Public Health and ITN Productions. I'm Natasha Kaplinsky. Now, with claims that long-term illnesses and conditions could break the NHS, it's clear that there's never been a more vital time to address the UK public's health and encourage the next generation to lead healthier lifestyles. In today's programme, we talk to the people determined to make it happen and hear about some initiatives designed to help. And we'll be heading to the prestigious RSPH Health and Wellbeing Awards, where best practice and achievement in public health are celebrated. The RSPH's Health and Wellbeing Awards are a highlight of the public health community calendar because as well as raising awareness of the need for better public health, they celebrate those who work towards it. Since winning an award in 2013, Food Nation Social Enterprise in Newcastle has been expanding its progressive food programmes to great success so it's no wonder they've been nominated again this year. Jonathan Gibson joined the team to find out how nutrition can be the gateway to mental well-being too. Hi guys! Hi! Hi. Do you want to pay an apron on? Yes! Yeah, bro. This is Food Nation in Newcastle, a two-time RSPH Health and Wellbeing Award winner. You can grab a seat if you want to, if you want to sit down. On today's menu, pizza and everyone's making it from scratch. These students are from Percy Headley, a college which supports young people with learning and physical difficulties. How are you getting on mate? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. What, what are you making then? Um, pizza. Is it nice to come here and learn to cook? Uh, yeah. Yeah? I've been cooking in my old school to make um, carrot cake, um, vegetable soup, um, stir fry. The students that we do have here today are part of a vocational programme. So it is a, a specialised programme for to promote domestic independence um, and to promote sort of transferable skills in independent living. It's looking at breaking down barriers, not just for what the student might envisage, but also employers envisage to recruiting somebody with a disability. How long are you going to need it for? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah. That's a long time. <laughs> now, it looks like it's going to be a good pizza. Yeah. Is it going to taste all right? Yeah. Yeah? You sure? Yes. So, Jamie, what are the values that underpin Food Nation? Food Nation's core value is health and well-being, and that runs throughout everything that we do here at Food Nation. So, yes, our vision to inspire people about good food, and we very much do that through practical, hands-on food education. So it'll be cooking skills, food growing, um, going into schools and doing work around nutrition, um, but lots and lots of services that at the centre of them is about inspiring and educating people about good food. It's going to be good, this. As well as working from its own kitchens, Food Nation takes its kitchen to clients as part of its outreach programme. Today the team have come to Changing Lives, a hostel for men dealing with emotional or addiction difficulties. OK, and we're just going to give it a little, a little tap with the, the, the flat of the knife. Look. Today Andy, John and Liam are learning to make gnocchi. Does it taste better when you make it yourself, John? Well, food does taste better when you make it yourself, instead of pre-packed pre, pre or pre-made. They have frozen meals, which, which is sometimes not very good for you at times. We want to give them the nutritional knowledge, uh, but we don't want to like throw it in their faces because with the type of group that we work with here, you know, they, they don't want to sit and learn like for too long or feel like they're being preached to. So we just try and drop in the little bits of information. If we get them all together in a group, it reduces social isolation. Liam's come to every session that I've done so far. He's an extremely competent cook. I think they've helped learn this how to make lasagna. I think it was the first week and I've done it again three days later. So it has definitely helped us, like, you know, as well as confidence and cooking as well. Another of Food Nation's priorities is sustainability, so using locally sourced or even homegrown ingredients wherever possible. 
As a social enterprise, Food Nation ploughs the profits it makes from selling goods and services back into the community. It's aimed to make Newcastle a more sustainable food city. Quite often we'll get asked by organisations to come and do bespoke work, so we'll work with youth groups within local communities. Um, we also have run a project for young people who are not in education, employment or training, so that's 16 to 25 year olds, really drawing them out of their shells, which is, is the struggle. I think that's probably the most rewarding part of what we do is working with young people because you really do see a change, especially when you put them in a slightly different environment which is slightly out of their comfort zone. In the Food Nation kitchen, pizza's ready. What do you think, guys? Yes. Mm -hmm. By teaching people to cook, Food Nation is also changing lives, tackling inequality head-on by improving everyday access to affordable and sustainable homemade food. I just love pizza. <laughs> Now, it's the 160th anniversary of the Royal Society for Public Health and joining me today to look back, if not over 160 years, over the past year and of course to the future is Chief Executive Shirley Kramer. Great to see you again, Shirley. We're Great not going to talk you. about the last 160 years, but let's talk about <laughs> the last year. And what would you see as the main highlights? Well, it's been a very interesting year and very mixed for public health. So we've been very concerned at RSPH about the drop in funding for public health in local authorities. And actually, this was picked up by the Health Select Committee this year, uh, worrying about the lack of investment in prevention. And I think all of us have been worried about that. So that was one huge piece of the puzzle for 2016. Another issue is the childhood obesity strategies, long awaited but extremely disappointing at the end of the day because it didn't include uh, marketing, promotion and advertising. So some disappointments and some concerns, but some good news too. And I would say that the standardized packaging for tobacco, we are only the second country to have that after Australia. And uh, our smoking stats are very good. Our prevalence rate 16.9%. So we're going down. So that's, I think, good news uh, for public health in the UK. I think other good news is that we have new guidelines on alcohol, which came out this year. Um, we've also got this sugar tax. So who knew that we would have a 20% uh, sugar levy and a potential for reformulation? And of course, we have Brexit. We have no idea uh, what this is going to mean for the public's health. There are many regulations from Europe. We are working on that now with other people in the public health community and we'll have a much better idea going forward what this is going to mean for us. And of course we have a new public health minister along with our new prime minister. All change. All so change. there are a number of challenges. There are of course some successes and there's a great deal of innovation around at the moment. What would you say you're doing to encourage that and champion it? Well innovation has always been really important in public's health because our challenges have changed. As you mentioned earlier it's our 160th birthday. Challenges 160 years ago were about infectious diseases and now we're non-communicable diseases and the risk factors, so drinking, smoking, uh, air pollution actually, all sorts of uh, what the food we eat. So we do have to be much more innovative in the way we think about things and there's huge amounts of innovation going on across the UK. How we champion it is by having health and wellbeing awards. And what we're doing is outing that really good practice in communities across the UK so that it can be taken up in other parts of the country. We're also um, providing a brand new qualification to support innovation. So to allow lots more people to be involved in understanding what's involved in health improvement. And interestingly, another, uh, I think, really important area that we've introduced this year is our Youth Health Champions, expanding that programme. The RSPH has had a lot of headlines this year, hasn't it? We have had a lot of headlines this year. It's been really a mega year for yeah. us. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done this year. And I think there were two areas where we outed really uh, issues as being a public health issue. So we had a very influential report on sleep, 
where we ask people to consider their slumber number, how many hours of sleep you get a night. Because we know from the evidence that um, sleep is a huge component of health and well-being. And I think our report that was, was all over the media, um, there was debate and dialogue and people began to think about it. I think the item that caused the most headlines, almost half a billion people saw our activity equivalence calorie labeling report. And this took us rather by surprise because it was an idea that uh, we discussed how do we affect people's behavior? How do we make people think slightly differently in that six seconds that they're, they've got to choose their lunch? So the idea of having little stick figures with the amount of time it would take you to walk off the calories in your packet of crisps or your biscuit um, really caught the public imagination. And we're hoping to take that idea forward over the next year. Your remit is so huge. We look forward to exploring many of the subjects we've just discussed over the course of this programme. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. The World Health Organization regards childhood obesity as one of the most serious global public health challenges of the 21st century. Jamie Oliver is on a continuing mission to improve children's health through better diet and increased activity. Our reporter caught up with him to find out more about his food revolution. Jamie Oliver, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Pleasure. Your crusade to reduce childhood obesity marches on, doesn't it? Congratulations on persuading the government to introduce a tax on sugary drinks. What specifically was it about that issue? Look, I mean, uh, good news is we got the sugary drinks tax. It's symbolic. It will show a drop off in consumption. Uh, we got it hypothecated. We ring fence that money and it's going to primary schools. So for food education, breakfast clubs, sports, amazing, right? But um, as much as I'm happy, and surprised, by the way. Um, it was one part of, you know, hundreds, hundreds of things that should have been strategized. I mean, it is, it is a war. The actual childhood obesity strategy plan under Theresa's government, it just, just uh, I think for a lot of people that are passionate mm -hmm. about the belief that we can, you know, Children are not put on earth to eat nuggets. You know, we've only got really ill in the last 30 years. Um, this is absolutely um, an environmental issue. So one thing, like a tax, is not going to work. Uh, a couple of cute things, not going to work. A handful of brilliant things will not work. It needs to be an ambush, a strategy. It needs to be deep and it needs to touch everything. You've been very vocal in your criticism of the wider childhood obesity strategy, but the government might say, well, you know what, it's easy to be critical. What specific detail would you have liked to see in there to make it more robust? What the plan said to me is no love. And to have the cheek to say that this is a world standard plan, don't talk to me about world standard plans. I spend my life traveling around the world more than any of that lot. I know what's world standard. If you want to know what's radical, go look at Chile. You know, and many countries that have to do stuff because they're so in trouble. You know, like Britain was and still is in a position to be a world leader in public health. But, you know, it's not a problem with the people in public health, it's leadership. We have no leadership in putting child health first. If child health was put first in every department of government, that plan would have been different. This country would be different and we would be looking at the next 10 years with an incredible spring in our step. Do you think the government could argue, though, that there's only so much they can do? They can encourage families to eat well, they can encourage parents to think about what they feed the children. No, I don't But there comes it. a tipping point where they're impinging on, on family life. No, no, no. Look, but basically, the, the kind of... the analysis of ill public health, the patterns of diet-related disease, um, the kind of... the correlation with that and the growing of brands and big business and technology and freezer and, and processed foods. I mean, it's, it's the most incredibly, fantastically clear bit of work. It's not rocket science. But really, you want to create an environment where we're in it together, everyone does their bit, and actually you can rise above and surprise us should you want to. And I think this plan does none of that. Well, that's about root and branch reorganisation, isn't it? It's about education, it's about the NHS, it's not just about what kids eat. 
Uh, look, um, it's, it's, it's everything about being British. It's everything about loving our kids. It's everything about the potential of looking after old people better. Like, if you cannot create an environment that is less obesogenic for the next generation, we cannot afford the NHS. I ain't no econo econo I can't even say economist, <laughs> right? But we can't afford it. And I think, um, so I think, I, I guess the sad thing for me, or my true belief, is we will change. We will get there. Because we have to, yeah. right? That's not my debate, is will we? The, the problem I have is how late will it be? And finally, Jamie, let's end on a high because you are an irrepressible optimist. You do think that we'll get there in the end. Um, what can organisations like the Royal Society for Public Health do in their campaigning to make sure we do get there? I think these are wonderful organisations. I think they're, you know, they, they have depth and stability and expertise and, and trust. And I think they're really, really wonderful. And, and I think um, other than doing what they're doing already, I think collaborating with others, yeah. other organisations, being timely, being proficient, using the same tools of marketing and PR and like precise timing um, and being agile and quick to play companies as robust as a soft drinks company that do employ the best lawyers and the best marketeers and the best PRs. Like we've got to try and get close to those guys. And, and I think, you know, what we're after is balance. We're not trying to win the war. We're trying to actually create an environment that has 50-50 choice, good and bad. And um, so... I am optimistic, Good. but I think collaboration is the name of the game. Jamie Oliver, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. Traditionally, public health education has been a late addition, if included at all, in medical degree curricula. But at the Institute of Urban Population Health and Care at King's College London, public health education is changing. Robin Ross went to find out more. Guys in St Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, those who train as doctors here receive one of the best medical educations in the world as King's College London students. The university already offers a well-established master in public health, but now, together with its NHS Trust partners, it's embedding this knowledge even earlier within the undergraduate medical programme from day one, introducing three themes, health improvement, health protection and service improvement. We will take uh, uh, 400 medical students on a totally um, revised uh, undergraduate medical degree program which really highlights um, the importance uh, of population science and quality improvement as a required capability of all future leaders in medicine. It's all part of the new Institute of Urban Population Health and Care. The aim is to equip the next generation with the leadership skills needed to transform mental and physical health care in the UK and the world. I think we're potentially at the start of a cultural revolution where um, every doctor uh, actually goes through their career with two jobs. One, to uh, provide care for their patient, but two, to wherever they see improvement is required, whenever they feel an improvement can be made, they see their job as, as, as an improver of care as well as a provider of care. Now, that's a completely different mindset. To help students think differently, the new undergraduate programme includes a year-long placement working in areas that need improvement. These students took part in a two-month pilot scheme at St Thomas's Birthing Centre. Only 20% of pregnant women were having their risk of blood clots assessed and recorded, a leading cause of maternal death. They collected data to understand why this was happening and then came up with some creative, simple ideas. We introduced a visual um, magnetic board system, we put stickers out and posters and then we introduced a loyalty card system. By the end of our third cycle it increased around 80% with our last day at 93%. I think it was really good to sort of become part of the clinical team, do something that made an impact and hopefully um, helped patient care in the future. The pilot students have been fabulous, they've obviously put a lot of effort into a relatively short time. Having the students there for a year also enables us to do some level of integration with our teams, the clinical teams that they will be working with to have longer exposure to patients, uh, to understand patient pathways and to understand the reality of changing things or improving things within the healthcare system. And I think that really is a core skill to being a better doctor. 
public health is more important than ever. 15 million people in England have long-term conditions such as diabetes, asthma and arthritis. According to a recent report, UK children are at a higher risk of premature death than their Western European counterparts, partly due to a lack of targeted public health policies. Dr Ingrid Wolf is leading a programme to make sure every person and organisation involved in a child's life is part of their care. This programme is all about joining up care uh, better. So it's primary and secondary care, it's about health and education, it's about mental health and physical health. So for example, children with asthma whose parents smoke should have stop smoking services for the parents as part of their routine care. All health interventions need to be evidence-based. Public health requires many information sources. Statistics and epidemiology are important, but also the broader social scientists uh, in, are needed, behavioural scientists, health psychology, um, and increasingly even health economists are important. This means that we need to fundamentally change the way that we, ch we train doctors. They have to have a broader approach to the evidence base on which they make the decisions. The ambition is still to care for the individual patient, but also to nurture doctors to think big. There are times when it is important to be a follower, there are times when it's important to sort of take a formal leadership role. But what we want everybody uh, to be able to do is to speak out uh, and to recognise that more of the same is no longer uh, uh, the appropriate solution. Do you feel really like I want to go out there and help more people? Definitely, definitely going to be a leader of the future. I think this is kind of helping me just to see what I can do and what I'm capable of and what we're capable as medical students. Um, so yeah, definitely for the future. In the UK and around the world, vaccination has saved more lives and prevented more serious illness than any other advance in recent medical history. But our traditional focus on vaccination for the young may no longer be enough, particularly as we face the global issue of antimicrobial resistance. Nick Thatcher talked to Pfizer about the vaccine success story in the UK and what more can be done. Good morning, David. Good morning, nice Dr. to see Marshall. you. How are you this morning? I'm a bit uh, tired, maybe a little uh, breath breathless. Dr. Ben Marshall is a consultant in respiratory medicine from University Hospital Southampton, who specialises in treating patients with acute respiratory infections. So, how many? patients do we have in the clinic this afternoon, Margaret? We have 50 patients, Dr Marshall. Five. And as a doctor working on the front line, he recognises the value of vaccinations in not just preventing illnesses, but also in reducing hospital admissions. Often patients don't realise that they are suffering from um, an easily preventable illness such as influenza or pneumonia. and. It's personally frustrating that perhaps we could do more in terms of public health campaigns to flag up who should be receiving vaccinations, which age groups, which patients with uh, chronic disease conditions, because um, many patients often aren't aware that they are eligible for a vaccination in a cost-effective way and perhaps don't even know that that can be provided in their own local general practitioner surgery. But while raising awareness of immunisation and maintaining vaccination rates for certain high-risk individuals can have obvious benefits, others believe more can be done to promote vaccination through life so that preventable diseases can be reduced across all age groups and new threats like antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance can be tackled head on. The government are doing a great job in vaccination here in the UK, but you can't be complacent because the bugs are clever. They can come back at any time and we see occasionally outbreaks uh, when vaccination rates drop. Uh, and also we're getting these special bugs now that are resistant to antibiotics. And so, you know, we, we need to develop more vaccines and we, we need to really push the science and keep going and invest in vaccination programs and invest in vaccination research and make sure again that people are really getting the vaccines that they need. The UK National Immunisation Programme is rightly regarded as a success story to be proud of. Vaccines have already significantly reduced the threat of diseases that were once widespread and often fatal. And after clean water, vaccination is seen as the most effective public health intervention in the world for saving lives and promoting good health. 
So it has focused for the last 15, 20 years very much on children and the elderly. Uh, we are now getting to a stage where the whole life course is being looked at, uh, but the focus should be about uh, aiming for the gold, uh, going for the best vaccination program, uh, trying to cover every possible individual who would benefit from the uh, vaccination um, and essentially using vaccination as a tool uh, in the fight against not just preventing these diseases but also wider activities like stopping antimicrobial resistance from emerging uh, and also reducing the cost to the healthcare system. Morning, this Paul. is the notes of one of the patients that we're following up in the clinic this afternoon yes. who suffered from pneumonia and is coming back. Back at the hospital, Dr. Marshall is preparing for his afternoon clinic. He raises the subject of vaccinations with all his patients, whenever it's appropriate. For protecting the public from disease, both now and in the future, is paramount to improve the health of the nation and reduce the burden on our NHS. And prevention is better than cure. Still to come on Championing the Public's Health. A novel approach to supporting the vulnerable. And... If I can just help one person, one person comes in here as a result of what I do and gets something, then yeah, job done. Plus, why living to a ripe old age is a postcode lottery. Now, one of RSPH's biggest campaigns of 2016 is to ask the government to rethink their drugs policy and take a more holistic public health-led approach. By decriminalising possession and transferring lead responsibility from the Home Office to the Department of Health, RSPH believes access to treatment can be improved and health harm associated with drug misuse reduced. Nick Thatcher asks... Is it time to take a new line on drugs? For decades, politicians have talked of a war on drugs, but now two leading public health organisations say it's time for a ceasefire and a rethink on tactics. In what's been described as a landmark intervention, the Royal Society for Public Health, together with the Faculty of Public Health, have called for the end of arrests and criminal proceedings for personal possession and personal use of all illegal drugs and for a greater focus on treating those who need help and support. So if we look over the last 20 years or so, whilst the level of use of um, particularly lower classification drugs has declined, the level of health harm has gone up, particularly the number of deaths. The number of deaths associated with drug misuse has more than doubled in this country over the past 20 years, and that should be a clear sign that the current strategy is not working. The report argues criminal sanctions failed to deter illegal drug use and can act as a barrier for addicts to come forward for help. It wants a Portuguese-style system where people using drugs are treated and not punished. However, dealers and suppliers would still be prosecuted. The report also suggests that responsibility for drugs policy should move from the Home Office to the Department of Health and that drugs education should be made mandatory. The most effective drugs education that's, that's done in schools, it has both a, a knowledge element which can be delivered by teachers, but it also has a peer education element that is uh, delivered by young people themselves. And you know, that has been shown to be very much more effective. What's been described as a sea change in approach has also been welcomed by one former undercover detective who believes current drug laws only serve to hurt the most vulnerable in society. Criminalising people who have a problem with drugs is only ever going to make their lives more difficult. It's only ever going to cause more problems for society. Because I mean, if you were just, just to look at it in economic terms, it is far, far cheaper to, to treat people who need help than it is to, to police it. The Home Office, though, says its policy remains clear and it will continue to prevent the use of illegal substances while still offering treatment and recovery services. But when it comes to public health, some influential voices now believe it's time to take a new line on drugs. 
Now, we all know that expert help with dependency on alcohol and drugs is crucial to giving them up. But one leading treatment provider recognises that also offering mental health services will increase the chances of a broader behavioural change. Paul Brennan visited Adaction to find out why challenging the current system could save lives. Kieran Allen is a support worker with Ad Action, a national drug, alcohol and mental health treatment charity. But originally he came here for help. After losing his leg in a road accident, he became addicted to painkillers, then heroin, and plunged into a 30-year battle with drugs, which even led to a suicide attempt. I just couldn't handle anymore. I just couldn't stand the weight of like what I was hiding from my family what I was doing, what I was doing to myself. I'd suffered many hospital inpatient admissions as a result of all this. And I just got so fed up and I was, I just swallowed as many tablets as I could. Kieran says his life was transformed by ad action, but his complex battle with both drugs and mental health problems is far from unique. According to a study by Imperial College, Four in five people on substance misuse programmes had a mental health issue in the last year, but only a minority are being treated for both. That's why Ad Action says the system isn't working and things need to change. What we're looking for is for influencers and people in government to actually start paying attention to what the people that actually use our services are saying to us. And what they're saying is they don't want to just be looking at one small part of their lives, like their drug use or their alcohol use. They want to be looking at everything in total. Whereas what happens now is a, a running sequence of different types of services, which inevitably mean there are opportunities for people to slip out, fall back and have to redo that all over again. By addressing coexisting problems both collectively and holistically, Ad Action says outcomes have multiple successes. Not only do people reduce their um, prescribed methadone dose, but also they improve their uh, physical health, particularly their chest problems and treatment for their liver uh, disease as well. Also mental health outcomes all improve, particularly around anxiety and depression and their general well-being. But really key to that and underpinning it is that they actually do more useful things with their time. So they engage in different groups uh, like allotments and um, they go out on walks in the countryside uh, and they get debt advice and we support them with their housing so that they uh, have a more stable base. Early intervention is seen as key and Ad Action has young volunteers helping with teen pregnancy education. It also runs a mind and body programme aimed at young people involved in or vulnerable to self-harming behaviours. It's really, really important to have early intervention. Um, we have a situation where three out of four young people identify that they are very anxious about speaking to their peers in relation to self-harm or in relation to mental health in general. What we've got is a situation where they can then speak to uh, our professionals uh, and encourage them to speak to other people so that they don't feel so isolated and that they don't feel so stigmatised. Looking to the future, Ad Action's employment, training and education groups help people not just rebuild their confidence, but their lives too. What we would really like to see is people joining up budgets so that services can be purchased that cover a, a range of different issues. So that are looking at drug and alcohol, looking maybe at smoking, looking at mental health services, maybe looking at sexual behaviour. So all the different things that people need to look at when they want to change their lives for the better. There's no such thing as a hopeless case in addiction. There is help, you know, and uh, who knows what form it's going to come in, you know, whether it's signposting to other services, whether it's getting treatment here. If I can just help one person, one person comes in here as a result of what I do and gets something, then, yeah, job done. Alcohol-related crime has fallen 40% since 2007, yet it remains a significant factor in almost half of violent incidents, according to government crime survey statistics. 
But a powerful partnership, supported by the alcohol industry's Portman Group, is not only helping the vulnerable with its responsible drinking message, but it's also taking pressure off health services and also improving local social environments. John Briggs reports. So we're in Sheffield City Centre. It's a Friday night. It's about half past six. We're actually on Carver Street. And as you can see, there really isn't a lot happening. But if you fast forward about four or five hours. So this is Carver Street at 1.30 in the morning. And this is the nighttime economy at its most vibrant. But if you're not careful, this is a time when things can also go wrong. But if the phrase nighttime economy makes you picture hedonistic alcohol fueled chaos, then you might be surprised. Many cities in the UK have pulled off some remarkable transformations, helped by the Portman Group's members, who represent every sector of the drinks industry. Ten years ago, um, we didn't have any of the procedures we've got in place now in relation to ID seizures, uh, ID scanners, uh, the, the buy-in that we've got from the clubs, the, uh, the health providers. So yeah, we, we've worked on it for the last ten years over those problems and those issues, and I think we've done really well. Some of those issues come under discussion when the pub and club owners get together under the umbrella of Unite. We, we meet on a regular basis, uh, we meet certainly on a monthly basis formally, and we, uh, we nail licensing issues, safeguarding issues within the city centre. We want to run pubs and bars that you can bring your mum to. If you can't bring your mum, then we're doing something wrong. And amongst the ideas making the nightlife more attractive to mums are awards like the Purple Flag, the city centre equivalent of the Blue Flag for beaches, and schemes like Best Bar None. I think Best Bar None as, as an audit is uh, seen by uh, bars and clubs as being of tremendous use to them. The essential criteria would cover everything that you would expect uh, an alcohol uh, sales business to have, and they have to pass that 100% uh, in order to get a Best Bar None award. And it's not just the obvious partners that make this work. It needs the assistance of the volunteers. In Sheffield, they call them street pastors, and they use simple, low-cost tricks to keep things sweet. Yeah, we, we have a good relationship with the doorman. We give them lollies, so they're really pleased to see us every time, especially drumsticks. Drumsticks are particularly popular. Uh, but we also carry with us, we carry uh, flip-flops and water and other things. The doormen are really good. And it's Hang on, why, why, do, why carry flip-flops? Uh, flip-flops for later on in the night when the girls have fallen off their massive big shoes. And none of this can function properly without CCTV. In Sheffield's case, that's over 70 cameras that keep watch over the city centre. So the CCTV is working. Uh, we've just heard there's somebody who's not in a particularly good way uh, at one of the local wine bars down here. So the four street pastors are off to try and find out exactly what's going on. Uh, you can see the place is filling up a bit now uh, and it's full of people having a good time. Luckily, this time it's nothing too serious and the police had beaten us to it. I've got it all sorted. They're probably, if the police are here, we'd probably leave it to them to deal with. Community Alcohol Partnerships, or CAP, have an impressive record of driving down localised underage drinking, and integral to their success is consistent use of the Challenge 25 Age Verification Scheme. It's about training staff so that they're confident to, to challenge people each and every time, and it's about making sure that people over time realise that this is a normal part of shopping. And working alongside it is the Proof of Age Pass Card. The pass card is a universally recognised piece of ID. We need to be vigilant and recognise that children and young people, whilst they're out in licensed environments, um, they need extra measures around them to, to protect them. Being vigilant is where Town Watch can be vital. It's a pub watch scheme for licensed premises. I think we've got a different flavour to our Town Watch. Uh, we set it up like most Town Watches as a crime reduction partnership really at, 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 at its heart when we first started it. But we've moved much more into a into kind of a trade group where we talk about best practice and excellence. Back on the streets, the drink aware crew are out supporting customers who may become vulnerable as a result of drinking too much. So if you do need anything, water or love or sympathy, come and grab us. But if all else fails, there's always the Bournemouth Safe Bus, designed to take the pressure off the emergency services.
My colleague uh, on the bus, the paramedic, uh, it, obviously it, it relieves the need for some people to go down to A&E, but alcohol, yes, is a huge part of the client base for the safe bus. And as our birthday boy weaves his way home, although he doesn't know it, the many services that collaborate in the local alcohol partnership are keeping a close eye on him. For people living in Scotland's most deprived areas, life expectancy is 13 years less than those living in the least deprived areas. NHS Health Scotland is working to reduce these stark health inequalities and holistically improve public health. Julie MacDonald visited Glasgow to find out more about their local and national work. For decades, there's been a huge effort to heal Scotland's health divide. Nowhere is the gap more visible than in the powerhouse city of Glasgow. Health inequalities across Scotland are growing and since the 1970s there's been irrefutable evidence that the problem is getting much, much worse. But it is a challenge that's starting to see some progress being made. I'm taking a trip with Director of Public Health for NHS Health Scotland across the city of Glasgow to find out more about the problem here that's repeating itself across the country. Health inequalities is a lost potential. Lost potential for people leading happy, healthy lives. Lost potential for the country and for the communities. We start our journey in the deprived area of Bridgeton in Glasgow's East End, ending up in affluent Jordan Hill, following Glasgow's life expectancy map. Well, there are dramatic differences and we look initially at uh, life expectancy. So a child born here, a, a boy born here, currently can expect to live into their mid-60s. So they get to what we think is retirement age, 63, 65, and half of their friends have died here. A boy born in uh, Jordan Hill can expect to live to their late 70s. In Jordan Hill, they can expect it to go another 13, 15 years. I head to the city centre to meet Jerry McLaughlin, chief executive of NHS Health Scotland, one of the organisations trying to reduce health inequality across the country. We want a fairer, healthier Scotland, and that's essentially what we are working towards. So a much fairer distribution of those life chances, those life outcomes. Even in a city as developed as Glasgow, eh, quite clearly the way in which we distribute our resources across the city um, are really quite different. Making sure every person has equal access to support that goes beyond their health problems is the key to solving this health crisis and a thriving money advice service here in one of Scotland's hospitals, the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow, is improving lives. For young mum Kirsty Telfer, whose twins were born at 27 weeks and are still in the care of the ward, getting financial advice and care from the team here has been a lifesaver. Um, one of the nurses had um, suggested just coming over here to see if there was anything they could do to help. They were very friendly, they were very welcoming. They can give you grants, they can help set up with your child benefit, your tax credits. You know, you've got enough on your plate with the boys that, you know, you don't want to be worrying about money as well. Frances McGuinness is a family support worker at the hospital. It's a very unique service. Probably one of the biggest things we do is emotional support to parents and carers. It could be to do with money. They've got problems with money and then in that case we, we then refer them on to the money advice service attached to this service. So it means that the families don't have to go outside the hospital, anything they need they can get inside the hospital. NHS Health Scotland supports projects like this because evidence shows that linking patients with an advice service works to change health inequality. So when patients and carers here were asked about their biggest worries whilst they or their family member was sick, it was finance and not health itself that was their biggest stress. The Money and Debt Advice Project was set up and that is a partnership between the NHS here in Glasgow and the advice sector. And what that means is that there is an advice worker who's based here in the hospital as part of this hospital service and nurses um, are asking patients about their money worries when they come in and referring them to the Money Advice Service. Partnerships between the NHS, private and third sector are starting to bear fruit in Scotland 
And the hope is that by tackling more than just a person's physical health, this decades-old health divide will be broken for good. Still to come on Championing the Public's Health, the children showing us the way to a healthy future. We are current generation, so it's up to us to you know, get this information, spread it to people with the young minds. A graduation with a difference. And... Join me later to find out how Northamptonshire County Council hope to lead the country in becoming happier and healthier by 2020. Now, supporting the RSPH's mantra that prevention is better than cure is a brand new campaign aimed at young people. It covers all areas of healthy living, from the importance of sleep to physical activity. Nick Thatcher went along to dream it, try it, live it. It's lunchtime and on the menu today, a range of nutritious dishes for these young people to sample and enjoy. But you can't wait to get stuck in, can you? As well as an opportunity for them to learn more about healthy cooking. And instead of using the butter, normally you use like butter and cream and you kind of associate with that in a cream potato really, wouldn't you? So I've used um, just a little bit of semi-skim milk and some olive oil. So it should sort of lighten that up a little bit. There's lots of different flavours in there, you know. It's all part of an exciting new campaign from the Royal Society for Public Health, challenging young people to adopt at least one new healthy behaviour and to dream it, try it, live it. What health means to me? I believe that an essential factor of healthy living is eating well. And through video content they've created themselves, these volunteers aged between 16 and 21 will promote the campaign online with the aim of getting other young people to think about their health and well-being. My video was about the Eat Well plate, which is nutrition. So it's about what food groups you should eat. It took me quite a long time to do, <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it. And so I hope that people who watch the video will be able to understand and try and change their lifestyle habits so, so they can live a healthier life. We're the millennials, aren't we? We are current generation. So it's up to us to you know, get this information, spread it to people with a young minds. I'm Malik Thomas, and this is what well-being means to me. You'll see from the films, there's some really great, great work that they've done. And it just highlights how creative they are and how engaged they are actively already in health promotion. And they want to take that responsibility and they want to find out more about their own health. So really, the campaign has just given them a framework to do that effectively. Dream It, Try It, Live It is supported by a number of organisations, including the I Will campaign. And one of their ambassadors, who's 19, is running this team-building workshop for the volunteers. It's vital that young people are inspired by other young people. I think it, it really sets that role model and it makes young people feel as if things can be achieved. And especially for me, if you're going to be influenced by a young person, it's much more relatable. You get that connection. One hope for this workshop and one hope for the future. This campaign is all about young people empowering each other to make informed decisions on everything from healthy eating to physical activity, mental well-being to the importance of sleep, and raising awareness as to how small changes in lifestyle can make a big difference to your health. If you dream it, try it, live it. Young people are the future, so their health and well-being is of vital importance to us all. In Wales, this is recognised within the school setting and is supported by the development of the largest national school health research network in the world. The School Health Research Network, or SHERN, is an exciting national innovation unique to Wales. It brings together secondary schools, key policy makers and researchers to promote the health of young people. The children here at Brint Egg School are having a huge influence over their own future. This is one of 115 secondary schools in Wales to sign up to a new initiative which uses research about their health and well-being to determine future priorities here at their own school. We believe that SHERN is the first and only national research network within schools 
What's really unique and exciting about it is that it actually brings partners together to identify important research questions, generate data, monitor interventions, and to really make a difference to pupils' health. Every two years, pupils complete an anonymous survey on a variety of issues, from healthy eating and exercise to emotional health and well-being. Each school receives a bespoke report showing the findings combined into an overall school picture for each health topic. Changes can then be implemented based on this data, with the involvement of pupils, staff and the wider school community. The anonymous data collected from all pupils in Wales, 32,000 at the last survey, can also be used nationally in research and policy development. It's enormously beneficial for us as a school in so much that we get a raft of data that we can use to tailor programmes of study within the school and also to consult with other interested parties such as parents, student council and external agencies to analyse the data and organise programmes of study accordingly. So Sadie, what changes have you implemented here? So we had a few suggestions about getting a salad bar installed and some more healthier options. So we took that on board and we've now got a salad bar in the low school canteen. And it's been really popular throughout the year groups and it's given everyone a really good kickstart to their day. This is the best source of data we've got about children's health in Wales and it's really useful in helping us to see about the new and emerging issues, so things like e-cigarettes and legal highs. Other data tends to take longer to come through so it really helps us respond quickly. Hey, Marco, bitty Nate! There is a recognition by policymakers that combined data from all network schools has national significance. Schools in Wales are also showing great enthusiasm for the network, including here at Ascolgumraig Bromorganug. The School Health Research Network is an exciting initiative that's already showing an impact at school and national level. I think it's absolutely vital. It's really important that schools understand uh, the health and well-being of their, their learners. Uh, we know that children who are emotionally and physically well engage better in teaching and learning and then get better educational outcomes. And this is a project that's really unique, um, that Welsh schools have the opportunity to have good quality data and information understand what's happening around health and well-being in their school and be able to monitor uh, the impact of their initiatives and how they're doing in improving that well-being. This network demonstrates the value of working in true partnership with schools, researchers and policy makers. Young people are the future, so their health and well-being is of vital importance to us all. In Wales, this is recognised within the school setting and is supported by the development of the largest national school health research network in the world. The School Health Research Network, or SHERN, is an exciting national innovation unique to Wales. It brings together secondary schools, key policy makers and researchers to promote the health of young people. The children here at Brint Egg School are having a huge influence over their own future. This is one of 115 secondary schools in Wales to sign up to a new initiative which uses research about their health and well-being to determine future priorities here at their own school. We believe that SHERN is the first and only national research network within schools. What's really unique and exciting about it is that it actually brings partners together to identify important research questions, generate data, monitor interventions, and to really make a difference to pupils' health. Every two years, pupils complete an anonymous survey on a variety of issues, from healthy eating and exercise to emotional health and well-being. Each school receives a bespoke report showing the findings combined into an overall school picture for each health topic. Changes can then be implemented based on this data, with the involvement of pupils, staff and the wider school community. The anonymous data collected from all pupils in Wales, 32,000 at the last survey, can also be used nationally in research and policy development. It's enormously beneficial for us as a school in so much that we get a raft of data that we can use to tailor programmes of study within the school and also to consult with other interested parties such as parents, student council and external agencies to analyse the data and organise programmes of study accordingly. 
So Sadie, what changes have you implemented here? So we had a few suggestions about getting a salad bar installed and some more healthier options. So we took that on board and we've now got a salad bar in the low school canteen. And it's been really popular throughout the year groups and it's given everyone a really good kickstart to their day. This is the best source of data we've got about children's health in Wales and it's really useful in helping us to see about the new and emerging issues, so things like e-cigarettes and legal highs. Other data tends to take longer to come through so it really helps us respond quickly. There is a recognition by policymakers that combined data from all network schools has national significance. Schools in Wales are also showing great enthusiasm for the network, including here at Ysgol Bromoganog in Barry. The School Health Research Network is an exciting initiative that's already showing an impact at school and national level. I think it's absolutely vital. It's really important that schools understand uh, the health and well-being of their, their learners. Uh, we know that children who are emotionally and physically well engage better in teaching and learning and then get better educational outcomes. And this is a project that's really unique, um, that Welsh schools have the opportunity to have good quality data and information understand what's happening around health and well-being in their school and be able to monitor uh, the impact of their initiatives and how they're doing in improving that well-being. This network demonstrates the value of working in true partnership with schools, researchers and policy makers. Through a series of wellbeing initiatives and mass participation events, the county of Northamptonshire is taking big steps to engage and encourage its residents to live a happier, healthier and more active lifestyle. Donna Bernard joined them as they took up that challenge and got on their bikes. Northamptonshire is taking the lead in the national battle against unhealthy lifestyles. It's now in its third year of hosting the women's tour, with the final stage here in Kettering. The event is an integral part of the council's ambition both to combat high obesity levels and become a fitter county. The people are out there lining the sides of the road cheering and it has a whole feel-good factor for the whole county. It brings communities together, out together on the street, waiting to welcome the tour as it comes through. Lots of primary schools have been out cheering us on, so I think that's really good to inspire the next generation of uh, young cyclists. It's really good, it's a brilliant, brilliant event coming to the county. It brings people into cycling, makes people realise that cycling's out there for everybody. I like to encourage my family to be healthy yeah, uh, with everything you see in the media about eating healthily and exercise. I just think it's good to pass on to them and give them a good start in life for hopefully when they get older to carry on. By creating a winning strategy to combat harmful habits, Northamptonshire hopes to encourage other local authorities to follow their example and build a healthier, happier country by 2020. The 2020 campaign is a range of initiatives connecting all council activity relating to health and well-being, one of which is the 20 million steps challenge. Walking has been proved to be the ideal activity for people of all ages. Uh, I think some of the data that has come out around obesity in young children and adults is frightening for a nice rural county and getting more children and adults out being active uh, will help in take some of the pressure off their public health within the county and make a, fit, like a, a healthier Northamptonshire both physically and mentally. I walk because I love walking. I walk because it's really good for my health. Uh, fitness levels are great. Mental well-being, great, because um, I'm out of doors, enjoying the countryside and walking with a bunch of friends. They're doing something that's making them more healthy and they're just going to have a better life if they do more exercising or do more walking. It makes your legs stronger and your body a bit more healthier. To reach those reluctant or unable to take part in activities, there are initiatives to get to people where they already are, such as the Healthier Workplace Programme, and making general advice freely available in public places, such as GP surgeries and local libraries. As the average life expectancy in the county continues to increase, prevention is at the heart of Northamptonshire's approach. The focus is not just on living for longer, but living well. We've created, for the first time, a prevention service that is actually really focused on making people well. 
first for well-being is what it says. It is the first place you go to for your well-being to be improved. I'm really proud of all we've done with that. With that. First for Wellbeing is a new social enterprise created by the County Council, Northamptonshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust and the University of Northampton. They consulted with the public and industry experts to create their unique Octigo assessment tool, which covers the key areas of well-being. For some people, it's been a lifesaver. For some people, uh, they've come to us in quite emotionally distressed uh, situation and we've put a plan in place with them and from being somebody who didn't want to go out or go back or not go to work we've had stories of people really improving and getting their life back. We've helped people give up smoking, we've helped people lose weight so across the board we've had good results. Northamptonshire is now working on how it can balance the inequalities that exist within the county and engage more with those in the poorest health. But with all departments coming together to get the community more active and out exploring the surrounding parks and countryside, the road to good health is well within reach. Encouraging inactive people to become more physically active can be a challenge if healthy living is not something they're used to. Active Cheshire has been targeting hard-to-reach inactive individuals to change unhealthy habits and get people moving in innovative ways that are tailored to their lifestyle. Our reporter Vanessa Cutterford visited Cheshire to find out more. These children at Rossmore Primary School in Ellesmere Port are walking, skipping or running their daily mile. Whatever the weather, they're outside getting an additional 15 minutes of activity around the playground or the school field. The teachers decide when to take a break from the classroom and it's become a highlight in the busy school day. The teachers have reported that they come back refreshed, stimulated, ready to carry on learning. It hasn't eaten into the curriculum at all and the children are just excited about doing it. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. They chat, they can chat to adults, they can chat to their, their, their friends. There's no pressure for any of the children, so they're being active without having to think, oh, it's hard work. It says fun and it'll get you exercise and it's, keep, and it's good for your heart. Like I always sing with Brooke and it gets fun, doesn't it? Yeah. And she always sings with me. I like doing it because I can run and jog with my friends and I like running around. This pilot scheme is part of Active Cheshire's drive to change people's fundamental habits. Around a third of 10 and 11-year-olds in Cheshire and Warrington leave primary school either overweight or obese, which is why Active Cheshire wants to make exercise part of everyday life. Nine-year-old Ebony Rowlands has seen the benefit of incremental change. She had a stroke a year ago. When she returned to school, she was in a wheelchair. She's been using the Daily Mile to gradually build her stamina. She can now walk the whole thing and has a goal in mind for next year. Fun, full time. Run the whole thing, my goodness me. Active Cheshire is trying to get adults in the community fitter and healthier too. And this hair salon in Winsford is playing a major role in that. Leanne Forsey runs Guys and Dolls Salon. Many of her clients are busy mothers with little time to exercise and cook healthy meals. Together with Active Cheshire, she recruited a group of them, dubbed Cheshire Girls Can. Every week they'd meet up, learn to cook healthy recipes and get moving. We did jive, we, all got, we had two jive instructors come in and taught us how to do jive, which I never would have dreamt of doing before. We did rounders, we did boxing, um, all run, run by Active Cheshire. For many of these women, this tuition and support group was the incentive they needed to change. Before it, I wouldn't eat properly. It was one meal. Um, chocolate crisp, that was mainly my breakfast and dinner. So now that we eat healthy and get active, I feel more awake. I'm not falling asleep on the sofa throughout the day where before I'd send the kids to school and just get on the sofa and sleep until they were due to come home. The social aspect and camaraderie of the group was also a lifeline to some of the women. Janine Jepson is a mother of five and full-time carer for her disabled husband. Mentally, I needed that break. I needed time out. I needed other people to talk to. Um, it was just basically time for me, you know, to make myself feel better. Because by being mentally healthy, I, I could be physically healthier because obviously I'd pick up better habits. I could train myself again to, you know, to be more sensible about what I eat, which I can pass on to my children and my husband. It's a trickle effect. 
whereby mothers pass on healthy habits to the rest of the family. And it's an approach that's working. Active Cheshire's mission is to get 50,000 more people more active more often by 2017. And we're confident we're going to smash the target because we were already at 35,000. By understanding the needs of local people, Active Cheshire is nudging them into behaving differently. Small steps are turning into great leaps and changing people's lives for good. Now, creating a dynamic, collaborative and engaging learning environment is key when educating the public health professionals of the future. The University of Liverpool's online Masters in Public Health connects students from all around the world to learn together in online classrooms. Online learning also allows students to immediately apply what they have learned to benefit their communities. Sue Saville joined the 2016 cohort on graduation day. Celebrating success with family and classmates, but some of the Masters of Public Health graduating here had never met each other face to face before as they'd studied online from across the globe. I've been looking forward to this day, meeting students from all over the world, a classroom on the global stage, meeting them today, in fact it's a day to remember. The buzz of graduation was particularly special for these mature students, all employed in healthcare already, all wanting to develop new expertise to address health inequalities in their own countries. I want to welcome you all here for the first time in Liverpool, congratulating you on your studies. So I think a big round of applause. While the Masters of Public Health course is designed to be fully online, it's not a distance learning course, but rather a collaborative and engaging platform with students and tutors interacting across the world. And it's a course increasingly appealing to more UK students. What's also unique about it is you can take the learning that you have in the classroom and take it into the field the very next day. So you're applying in practice what you've learnt in the classroom straight away. You're not delayed because you're having to study overseas. You can take that learning out to the communities that you're working with and you can benefit them straight away. The philosophy behind the course echoes the work of Dame Margaret Whitehead, who emphasised the importance of the social determinants of health and structural inequality. The living conditions, working conditions, whether you uh, are going hungry or have enough to eat, uh, whether you have clean water, whether you have access to education, a good job, etc. All these things have huge influences on your health. 96% of the students on Liverpool University's Masters of Public Health course are from outside the UK. And after three years online collaboration, many are meeting fellow classmates and tutors here for the very first time. It's very nice to meet you. It's great that you made it over here. Congratulations. They encouraged critical thinking and they taught us how to be more understanding and to kind of respect the ideologies of others, not just us. It was wonderful. The flexibility is amazing. These people have jobs, these people often have families, uh, and they're not in a situation where they can go to an on-campus university. So this they can study from home, from, fit it in in their own schedule, uh, manage their time within their lives. Top performing graduate Fires Samji valued that flexibility and collaboration while he studied the MPH course in Canada. I'm here today to introduce the Management of Health Systems module. Fires works with vulnerable children and found he could empower them with health promotion techniques he'd learned from the diverse global perspectives online. I can bring that perspective and those strategies and those um, theor theoretical models that I learn globally from a top UK university and I can bring that to the table to my employer and I apply that daily. Knowledge that enhances the career prospects of the MPH students and benefits their wider communities. It allowed me to go back home to Somalia so we were there as a team to transfer skills and knowledge that we'd picked up from our masters in public health to try and train um, healthcare workers there. These graduates follow in Liverpool's proud tradition of leading the way in public health. 
and by learning online, they've set new heights of achievement. And that was the final report of the programme. We hope you enjoyed watching Championing the Public's Health, a programme by the Royal Society for Public Health and ITM Productions. From me and the rest of the team, goodbye. <laughs>